Hello and welcome to Chandler Science, AP Physics 1 Test Corrections for the Dynamics Exam. Alright, in this video we're just going to go through the test, question by question, going to solve each problem so you can help, or I will hopefully help you with your uh, your corrections that you're going to do. So remember, if you are in my class, uh, which I don't know why you would be watching this unless you were in my class, but um, so your corrections, don't forget, you need to write down what your answer was, what the correct answer is, why you picked that wrong answer, and then why the correct answer is the correct answer, right? So help me understand uh, the misconception you have about uh, about that problem. Okay. All right. Let's go and dive in. Number one, um, we have a graph. It's a speed time graph. We should right away we see a speed time graph. We should be thinking about what those types of graphs tell us. Uh, in this case, speed time graphs tell us the slope tells us acceleration, and the area under the curve would give us the displacement. Um, but uh, the distance, I should say. But um, we don't need that part. We just need a slope here. So let's look at the question. Is an object of mass 10 kilograms? is released from rest above the surface of a planet such that the object's speed as a function of time is shown by the graph above. The force due to gravity exerted on the object is most nearly what? All right, so of a planet, not necessarily the Earth, the Earth, right? It's some other planet. So we know that um, we're looking for the force due to gravity. That's Fg, right? That's the weight force. Weight force is mg. We know that. M is 10, because it tells us right here the mass is 10. So what's g? Remember, g stands for the acceleration due to gravity. Wherever you are, right? On Earth, it's 10, but if we're not on Earth, it's something else. So what is it on this planet? Well, the slope of a line is the change in Y over the change in X. What's the change in Y here? Up 7 over 2. So 7 over 2 is 3.5. So that must be the acceleration, because it's a speed time graph and slope is acceleration. Put that in for G, 3.5. That's force of gravity. Force of gravity is 10 times 3.5, which is 35. Newtons, and there you go. All right, cool. Number two, a box, a uh, 50 Newton box, uh, that means its weight is 50 Newtons, right? Is at rest on a horizontal surface. The coefficient of static friction between the box and the surface is 0.5. The coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.3. A horizontal 20 Newton force is then exerted on the box. The magnitude of the acceleration of the box is most nearly what? All right, so I mentioned this class a few times. If they give you a static friction coefficient, the only reason they're really giving you that to you is because they want you to check to make sure are you even going to overcome the static friction force? Is he, are you going to move the box at all? Are you pushing hard enough? Right? So friction force uh, for static is less than or equal to mu, which is 0.5, times the normal force, which in this case is 50 because it's a flat surface we're on, no ramp or anything, and there are no other vertical forces. Right? We have mg down and normal force up and there are no other vertical forces pushing down or lifting the box up. So in this case, the normal force it does equal the weight force, 50. Uh, so 0.5 times 50 is going to be uh, 25. So friction force for static friction is less than or equal to 25 newtons, right? That means that the friction static force can go up to 25, but not over it. If you go over 25, you overcome static friction, and then it becomes kinetic friction, and it starts to accelerate. Of course, um, we're pushing with 20 newtons force. So that means that we are not overcoming the 25, right? That 20 newtons of force means that the static friction force can match it. It's going to also push back with 20 newtons, right? If we push 20 here, it's going to push back with 20 newtons there, and we're not going to accelerate at all because the net force is zero. So the answer is A, zero meters second squared, because we are not overcoming static friction force. All right? Number three, a block is projected up a frictionless plane with initial speed V0. <clears throat> the plane is inclined at 30 degrees above the horizontal, so we have plane, 30 degrees, box on the plane, only has two forces on it, right? Weight down, mg, and normal force this way. There is no friction force. It says it's frictionless. What is the approximate acceleration of the block at the instant that it reaches its highest point on the inclined plane? I don't know if this part confused anyone. At the instant it reaches highest point, what's the only force accelerating the box? The weight force, right? Down the ramp. So that means that you can't turn weight off, right? Gravity is what's causing that. So highest point or not, it doesn't make a difference. Um, the, the cause, what's causing acceleration is gravity. You can't turn gravity off, so it's not going to be zero, okay? It still has acceleration. It stops for a moment. Its velocity is zero, but its acceleration is still not zero. All right, so let's look at our net force equation here, our Newton's second law. Acceleration is net force over the, over the mass m. Uh, well, since there's no friction, the only forces on this object that are going to cause an acceleration are its component down the ramp this way, right? The red 
weight component down that way and then we're going to have the uh, component into the ramp here right the blue component and again since there's no friction we don't really care about um, the normal force or the blue component right they're not really they're not doing anything because they're canceling each other out and there's no friction to calculate so it doesn't matter so the only force that's doing anything to this block is that red component there right so acceleration is going to equal the red component that's the force mg sine theta over m right that's the math just newton second law here mg sine theta over m well m's cancel right there's an m on top and an m downstairs so they cancel each other out so acceleration is going to be g is 10 sine of theta is a half sine of 30 is a half over the mass, which is, oh, it got canceled, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so 10 times a half is five meters second squared. The force is pointing down the ramp, right? So answer is gonna be uh, B, five meters second squared, down the incline, because there's no friction. So it's just half the weight force pulling us down the ramp, all right? Okay, um, brief pause here. I'm gonna get a drink of water and I'll be right back for number four. All right, start with number four here, after my break. Uh, number four is talking about this um, contraption. We have tension in the string here, and another uh, rope at an angle, and a mass hanging vertically. The horizontal wire shown to the right, uh, and the figure above will break when the tension in it exceeds the value T max. What is the maximum mass M that the hanging object can have without the horizontal wire breaking? Assume the wire on the left does not break prior to the horizontal wire breaking. All right. So uh, we got to recognize here that we're at rest, and that forces are zero. Right, so we have forces in the y direction vertically. We have forces in the x direction horizontally. This guy pulls uh, horizontally here, right? This other wire up here has, is going to have components horizontally and vertically. The angle here is theta. So we we should recognize we need to recognize that T max. Oh, pin's getting weird. T max that, that's this guy right it's, this is t max here it needs to equal let's call this t1 i just arbitrary thing call that tension in that wire t1 up there that needs to equal t1 cosine of theta right because this component your color this component here is horizontally to the left and the t max component is going to be horizontally to the right, right? So they gotta cancel out because we are ha we have net force of zero because of the sign's at rest, right? The sign's not accelerating anywhere. So we know that must be true. And we're also gonna say that this vertical component here must equal the weight down of the box, right? Because again, we need, we need the upward and down forces to cancel as well. So we also know that T1 sine theta, right? Opposite, opposite over here, is gonna equal big MG. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to actually do we need to do substitution, all right? We're going to uh, divide this guy right here by cosine theta, and then this side by cosine theta. These will cancel. I'm going to get I'm going to I'm kind of awkwardly going up here now, but hopefully you can follow me. Okay, so I get t1, uh, t1 or sorry t max not t1 sorry. I want to erase that. Eraser's not working. That sucks. All right. Eraser. There we go. Oh, okay. This is awkward. All right. T max over the cosine of theta equals T1, right? We've just divided by cosine theta. Now I'm going to take this guy here. I'm going to plug him in. So that T1, this is their equivalent, right? T1 equals T max over cosine theta. So I'll plug it in for T1. I'll go down here now to finish. So I'm gonna have, instead of T1, I'm gonna write T max over cosine theta. That's being multiplied by sine theta. Remember this here was T is, is being plugged in for T1. Times sine theta equals big MG. We're trying to find the mass, right? What's the mass M, the maximum mass we could hang from this wire without the wire breaking? Um, so this is gonna simplify down to T max sine theta over the cosine of theta equals big MG. Now, I don't know how well you know your trigonometry, 
but I would say you don't need to know it super well. You know, there are these things called trigonometric identities. They're basically like the, these equivalencies that like certain thing equals certain other things. For example, sine of theta over cosine of theta is equivalent to tangent of theta. All right. Now, it, you don't. There's, there's a lot of these. There's a long, long list of these trigonometric identities. You don't need to know all of them. You don't really know any of them, except for maybe this one. Probably the only one I'd say that's like you want to remember. You can look up what list of them if you want to to see what the other ones are. But this is one you probably want to remember. remember. So we can simplify this down. Sine over cosine is, tan, uh, is tangent. So we get T max tangent of theta equals big M G. You want to solve for M, so I divide by M, or by, sorry, by G both sides. These G's cancel and we get M equals T max times tangent theta over G which gives E the correct answer. All right, number six, or number five, I should say. We got a rope pulling up uh, tension on the box. So let's draw a little free body diagram real quick. I'm gonna have weight down, mg, is equal to, I actually was gonna add that inning. That's good. Uh, oh, another two ounce, great. Uh, mg is down at 20 newtons. All right, mg, mass two, g is 10, so 20 newtons. Then upward, we have a 10 Newton uh, upward tension force. The question wants to know, um, what is the acceleration of the block? Well, acceleration A is the net force over the mass. What are the forces on the object? Well, we have up, a positive up, remember up is positive, so positive 10 Newton force minus the 20 Newton down, downward force divided by the mass of the object is two kilograms, right? Remember mass, not weight, just M, so two. That's gonna equal A. 10 minus 20 is negative 2. So negative 10, I should say. Yeah, well, negative 10 over 2, and that's going to simplify out to negative 5 meters per second squared. So negative is down, so it must be E. All right, cool. Number 6. The box is given a sudden push up a ramp. All right, a push up the ramp. Friction between the box and the ramp is not negligible. I know it's a double negative, as some of my students pointed out, but you know, if you hopefully understood during the test that not negligible means that there is friction, right? So do not ignore it. Um, which of the following diagrams best represents the directions of the actual forces acting on the box as it moves upward after the push? After the push. Okay. If it's after the push, that means we're no longer in contact with the box, right? We are no longer applying a, a force on the box. So there is no fourth applied force, right? We're going to have the box going up the ramp. If it's going up the ramp, that means friction opposes motion. So friction is down the ramp. We have MG, I can draw it better hopefully. Oh, now my race is working, okay. MG straight down, that's pretty good, a little better. And then normal force going this way, right? Normal force here, this is friction here. And so there we have it, right? Which is where the answer is A, okay? There's only forces, there's no applied force because we're no longer, we're no longer touching the box. Friction opposes motion, so if we're going up the ramp, that means friction is pointing down the ramp. All right. Just checking the score of the Astros game. Okay. Um, in this equation or this problem, we have a we got a diagram here of a box or some object sliding along the ground. The force diagram above shows a box accelerating to the right on a horizontal surface of negligible friction. That's always nice. So no friction. Okay. The tension T is exerted at an angle 30 degrees above horizontal. So it's 30 degrees here. If mu is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the box and the surface, which of the following is a correct mathematical equation derived by applying Newton's second law to the box? All right, well, Newton's second law, what do we got? It's A equals the net forces over the mass. All right, we're going to take this guy and kind of expand it, right? Well, what are the net forces? Well, let's see. We have, first of all, we should recognize here that the upward normal force, the downward tension force is going to cancel, but... Remember in this case that the normal force does not equal mg because we have components of the tension force to the right and then up. So this upward portion of the tension of the tension force is going to kind of help out the normal force, right? The normal force won't have to be quite as big. So we got to keep that in mind as we're doing this. So the forces we're really worried about here are this this force and the friction force, right? This component of the tension force here going horizontally and the horizontal friction force. We know that all the upward forces are going to cancel all the downward forces because the box is not accelerating up into the air, right? So acceleration is going to be, all right, let's do this this component here. Let me erase all this so you can see. 
I want to erase those. There it goes. Okay. Um, let's deal with this component here first, right? This horizontal component. So that's going to be T cosine theta, right? Because it's, it's adjacent to the angle here. And we're going to minus the friction force. But you'll notice that none of these answer choices have just friction force in them, right? So we got to think one step further. What is friction force? Friction force is mu times the normal force. None of them have like an F instead of Fn, kind of backwards there. Why won't it erase? Uh, I don't know why. It's doing it random. Okay. Normal force. There we go. All right. So, but again, none of these options have just normal force in them, right? So we got to think one step even further than that. What is normal force? Well, we know that the net direct, the net force in the y direction is zero. So we know that we have a positive upward normal force plus this component of the tension force, right? They're both pointing up. So that's T sine theta minus big MG here. And that must equal zero. All right, again, sine theta because it's we're opposite the angle here, right? I might want to raise. Um, all right, so we're going to solve for Fn, right? Because we're trying to get, we're trying to figure out what goes in here. So I want to add MG to the, to the other side and I'm going to subtract T sine theta. So I got Fn equals MG minus T sine theta. I'm going to plug this in to there. So the force of friction minus is mu times mg minus T sine theta. All that over the mass of the object, because remember, we're Newton's second law, right? All that over mass, which is why the answer is D, right? OK, cool. Moving on to number eight. All right, number eight, an elevator carrying a person of mass m is moving upward and slowing down, or as important. So if we're moving upward, that means velocity is up, right? So velocity is up, but we're slowing down. That means that the acceleration is opposite that direction, right? We talked about, about that before, how if we're slowing down, velocity vectors and acceleration are in opposite directions. So if we're slowing down, that means acceleration is opposite, so down in this case. How does a magnitude f of the force exerted on the, on the person by the elevator floor in other words, a normal force, right? That's normal force we're talking about. Compare with the magnitude mg of the gravitational force. Well, if we're accelerating down, right? If there are only two forces on the object, normal force up, and then the weight down mg. It's the only two forces we have. If we're if our acceleration is down, that means net force is also down, which means which means that mg down needs to be larger than the normal force up, right? Because our net force in total is down. Which so the answer has to be a. That's the only one that really makes sense. Mg greater than F because, it, again, the net force is down. Um, don't know how else to say it, really. All right, so number nine, then. Um, the stacks of boxes is shown in the figure above are inside an elevator that is moving upward. The masses of the box uh, of the boxes are given in terms of the mass M of the lightest box. Assume the elevator has upward acceleration A. All right, so accelerating upward A. And consider the stack that has two boxes of mass m. Right? So we're talking about this stack right here. What is the magnitude of the force exerted on the top box by the bottom box? What is the magnitude of the force exerted on the top box by the bottom box? OK. Um, the magnitude of the force exerted on the top box by the bottom box. So here's the top box, right? What forces are acting on that box, right? Well, we have someone's pushing it up and someone's pushing it down, right? So we have its own weight down. What's pushing it up is the force. What really is a normal force, right? But where is it normal force coming from? It's coming from the bottom box, right? That's the box that's pushing it up. They're calling it um, the force exerted uh, by the bottom box. So we, we have been calling it the normal force this whole time because that's the surface it's sitting on, right? The surface here is the, is, is the, other, the other box, right? So how hard is it pushing it? Remember, we're accelerating up. It's important to remember that we're accelerating in a positive upward direction. That means that uh, our net force is up. So what are all the forces in the positive or in the vertical direction? Well, we know that uh, net forces equals ma. This is Newton's second law. What are all the uh, what are all the um, forces? Well, we have them right there. Normal force, positive. So we'll call it up or up positive minus mg because it's going down equals ma. We are accelerating, so A isn't zero. So we have, we're going to leave just MA, right? We don't have any of the numbers. We're just going to leave it like MA. It's OK. I'm going to plus MG to this side. So FN equals MA 
plus mg, we can factor an m out, factor the m out, get m times a, make that better, a plus g, all right, which is d. All right, so we gotta recognize, right, guys? It's Newton's second law, and always comes back to this guy, right? Sometimes we, sometimes we do the net force equation, where we have net force equals to whatever. Sometimes we put in the put in the ma, mass and acceleration. Sometimes we use it at, at this form, right? A equals f over m, but it's all the same thing, right? It all comes back to that guy. So hopefully this made sense, right? We just have our net forces, one force up, weight down. I think the key to this problem was understanding what they were asking for. Uh, the force exerted on the top box by the bottom box. We had to recognize that that's actually is referring to the normal force. So anyway, all right, going number 10. Same situation, same elevator, all the different boxes inside. The stacks of boxes shown in the figure above. Well, okay, all the same stuff. All right, assume the elevator is, move, is moving at a constant speed. All right, this time we're not accelerating. We're going at a constant speed. And consider the bottom box in a stack that has two boxes of mass 2m. All right, so we're talking about this box right here. That's our system. Let f of the floor be the force exerted by the floor on the box. Fg be the force exerted by gravity on the box. And f box be the force exerted by the top box on the bottom box, which is the following best represents the forces exerted on the bottom box. All right, the answer is going to be C. The floor pushes up on this box, so if we draw I'll do a dot. The floor pushes up on the box. The box's own weight pulls it down. And the and the top box also pushes down on the, on the box, right? So we have two arrows going down. F, the weight force and the, what they're calling F box is, is this, the other box sitting on top of it, right? Also adding its own weight to pushing down on the box. And we have the, the floor pushing us up. It's the normal force, right? And the normal force needs to be, notice how it's longer, right? Because these two down need to add up to the going going up. Because we're going at constant speed, which means there's no acceleration. So the net force must be zero. So the two downward forces need to add up to equal the one upward force, right? That's why the arrow is longer. All right, so it sees right answer there. Let's go number 11. All right, block X of mass M is attached to a block Y of mass 2M by a light string that pass over negligible uh, uh, over ne a, pulley, a pulley of negligible, negligible friction bleh, and mass, uh, as shown to the left. All right. In what in which direction will the center of mass, what they're calling COM, just an abbreviation for center of mass, of the two block system move after the after it is released from rest? And what is the magnitude of the acceleration of block X? All right. Okay. So yeah, hopefully you can realize like what, the center of mass is this idea. We didn't talk about it specifically in class. I think I mentioned it in, in one of the videos. But center mass is a spot. Let's say you have an object, like that's just a one box, right? The center mass is generally in the, in the center of the object. Not always, but usually is. So what that what it means is that it's this, it's the spot where if if you look around the object, it has equal mass all around it. So this this region equal mass, equal mass, equal mass, equal all the little spots around it is surrounded by equal amounts of mass on all sides, right? Now sometimes you get weird shaped objects. Like maybe like some sort of like a uh, U-shaped object, like an object that was like a magnet, right? Something like this. The center of mass could be like right here, maybe, right? The center of mass doesn't have to actually be on the object, but we're not going to deal with objects like that really in this class. Most of the objects we deal with it with in this class are going to be fairly simple boxes or spheres, stuff like that. So generally speaking, the center of mass of an object is in the center of that object. But this is a two object system, right? We have, the system is M and 2M, that's the system. So center mass is gonna be, if you kind of draw a line between the two uh, center masses, the center mass is gonna be kind of along that line, but it's gonna be more towards the 2M box because it's got more mass, right? So now this 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 uh, dot here, this X I marked, is kind of, it's on the line between the two of them, but it's more towards the 2M box because the 2M box has more mass, right? So it's kind of it's equally distant now between all the mass, okay? And when we re when we release these uh, blocks, what's going to happen? Well, we should kind of rec we should be able to recognize that what's going to happen is uh, the box Y is going to accelerate down and box X is going to go to the right. Well, if box Y goes down and M goes to the right, then won't this center mass also kind of kind of follow those two boxes and also go down and to the right, kind of chasing? The heavier box in a sense so we can rule out b and rule out d because it definitely won't remain at rest right the boxes are accelerating 
So, so is the center mass. It will also accelerate. Uh, so what's the acceleration of the system? Well, the system acceleration equal to the net force divided by the mass of the system, which in this case is 3m, right? Now, what are the forces on the box? Well, we have, uh, there's no friction. Um, so the only force acting on the system of blocks is the weight force of the bigger, larger 2m box, right? So 2mg pulling the box down. So our forces are going to be 2 mg divided by 3m. The m's cancel, and we're left with acceleration equals 2g over m, which means our answer must be a. Center mass is down to the right, and then we have our correct acceleration, 2g over 3. Uh, two, oh, sorry, 2 yeah, 2g over 3. Oh, I, I wrote it wrong here. I'm sorry, guys. 2g over 3, my bad. Fix that real quick for you. 2g over three. Oops, sorry. Okay. There we go. All done. All right. Number 12. All right. Number 12. Um, an Atwas machine is set up by suspending two blocks connected by a string of negligible mass over a pulley as shown above. The blocks are initially held at rest and then released at time t equals zero. The speed of the three kilogram block at time t1 equals two seconds is most nearly what? So we're going to combine a little bit of kinematics here with um, Newton's laws. So first we got to find out what the acceleration of the system is. Um, since they're both they're connected by a string, if we find the acceleration of the system, we found the acceleration of both blocks. So acceleration of the system will be net forces over the net over the mass mass of the system, right? So it'll be five. The forces are, and let's call of course this way going to be negative, and then we'll say this way on the pulley is going to be positive. Don't forget direction of these pulleys, super important. And so we have the this guy's mass. Mg pulling us down. That's uh, negative 20, and then this guy here needs to be positive 30. So our net force is 30 minus 20 over the net force, which is 5. So it's going to be uh, 10 over 5. That's going to be acceleration of 2 meters like squared. Looking for the velocity of the um, blocks two seconds after they're released. So, the initial, so we're going to use VF equals uh, V naught plus AT, VF for final velocity. Uh, v naught was zero because it started from rest. Uh, A is, now we know it's two. T was also two, two seconds later. That's going to be our final velocity V. Two times, two times two is four plus zero. So our final velocity is four meters a second. A tennis ball is thrown against a vertical concrete wall that is fixed to the ground. The ball bounces off the wall. How does the force exerted by the ball on the wall compare with the force exerted by the wall on the ball? This is straight up Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. When the ball collides with the wall and pushes on the wall, the wall uh, pushes back on the ball with an equal but opposite magnitude force. So the answer is B. Force exerted by the ball and the wall have the same magnitude, opposite direction, but same magnitude. Um, don't know, don't 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 know what else to say about it except for third law, right? I mean, all I can really say. All right, um, number fourteen. Block is pulled along a surface of negligible friction by a spring scale that exerts a force F on the block. The mass of the block is four kilograms. If the spring scale reads 10 newtons, which of the following free body diagrams can be used to show the magnitude and direction of all the forces exerted on the block as it is pulled along the surface. All right, so what I wanted you to recognize here was that if the mass of the object is four kilograms, that means it's, its weight force down, mg, is 40 newtons, and, and that's an n, and the upward force is also 40, the normal force up is also 40 newtons, but we're only pulling to the right at 10 newtons. So they wanted you to recognize that the spring force, the answer is C, the, sp the spring force we're pulling it with to the right is much smaller than the normal force or the gravitational force down, right? You'll notice that the spring force here only goes one block, one little square to the right, right? One little dash. And the upward and downward forces are one, two, three, four. Because the, the gravitational force and normal force are four times larger, right? 40. Four times larger than the spring force to the right. So that's why the answer is C and not, in, not any of the other ones, all right? All right, number 15, uh, the free body diagram above shows um, a five kilogram box on a rough surface. 
being pulled to the right at a constant speed. That's always important, right? Constant speed by a string that is at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the box and the surface is 0 0.3. The tension in the string is most nearly what? All right, what we gotta recognize here is that this, this component that I have circled already, that component of the tension force and the backwards friction force must be equal, right? They gotta cancel because we're moving at constant speed, which means there's no net acceleration. So that means that the, I'm gonna call this tension force T times the cosine of theta, right? That's this component here. It's adjacent to the angle, so he's cosine, is gonna be equal to mu normal force, right? Because that's friction force, right? Remember, this, this is coming from, this guy here is coming from friction force, which is mu times the normal force, okay? So I'm just replacing that with, um, with that guy. Now the problem here is that the normal force is not just the same as the weight, right? Because uh, there is this pesky little component of the tension force going up, which is going to change what the, what the normal force is. So let's see what normal force is. Normal force is going to be, it's Fn here, is gonna be equal to, or let's start out with a, a net force equation in the y direction. Net force equation for the y direction, we know it must be zero. We have the tension component going up, tension sine theta, right? That's this component here, plus the normal force, Fn, must, all that combined must equal the downward weight force, right, mg. So if we solve for Fn, we get Fn equals mg minus T sine theta. So I'm gonna plug in this for, uh, I mean, again, remember the friction force equation was friction force equals um, mu, times Fn. So I'm gonna plug in this Mg minus T sine theta. I'm gonna plug this in for the Fn, right, for normal force, since they're equivalent. So I get T cosine theta equals mu times, and then I have Mg minus T sine theta. I'm gonna distribute the mu to both terms and then simplify down. Um, so I get T cosine theta equals mu mg minus mu t sine theta. I'm gonna add mu t sine theta over to this side because I want my t's together because I want to combine them because they're like terms. Remember that cosine of the angle and sine of the angle and mu are all just numbers, right? They have an actual value. They're not unknown quantities. They're known quantities. So these are all in terms of t. So we can combine those. They're like terms. So we're gonna get uh, t cosine theta plus mu t sine theta equals mu mg. Let's simplify things down now and put numbers to this stuff. All right, so um, mu is 0.3. mg is going to be, uh, it's a five kilogram box. So mg is 50, right? So 50 times 0.3 is 15. Sine of theta, theta is 30 degrees. So sine of theta is a half. So, and then mu is again is 0.3. So 0.3 times a half is 0.15. So this is 0.15 T. And then a cosine of theta, cosine of 30, is 0.866. This is 0.866 T, right? And we get, these are, again, these are light terms, right? We're just gonna add them together. So 0.866 plus 0.15 is 1.016. So I'm gonna go I'm running out of room. I'll go over here, I guess. So this is 1.016 t's equals 15. We just divide by 1.016. Divide by both sides, right, to get our t. So if, uh, 15 divided by that will be 14.76, which is very close to the correct answer, which is a. And I think the only, the only reason why they got a slightly different answer was because they were using 9.8. You know, I got this problem from the College Board, so they must have been using 9.8 for g. That's why it's slightly off, but again, if you get 14.76, look at your options, what's the best answer, right? Clearly the one that's very close to your answer, instead of 14.76, 14.47, close enough, right? All right, so there you go, that's number 15, go to number 16. Three identical blocks, X, Y, and Z, hang from identical strings as shown in the figure. Uh, which of the following free body diagrams could you represent the forces exerted on block Y? So block Y is the middle block, right? So what are the forces on block Y? Well, it's always gravity, right? Weight force down, M, G, what they're calling diagram F gravity. So let's call it F, G, I guess, because we're going to match up with their diagram. 
FG here. Now we also have this tension, this wire, right, pulling us up. So that's tension pulling us up. Call that T. And then we're also going to have this wire pulling us down, right? Because the weight on block Z pulls the wire, which pulls this wire pulls block Y down. So we have another arrow pointing down. It's going to be tension, call it tension two and tension one, right? So we should have, it says that they're at rest, right? Uh, they're hanging there, so they're at rest. So that means these two down arrows should equal the one up arrow, right? All the arrows got to cancel out. Now the two down, if you combine them with the up arrow, should equal out. So you look at here, answer is B. So two down arrows here, just like we did on our diagram. Canceling out the upward arrow, if you look at the magnitude, we have one, two, there are two boxes down, but there's two of them, so total downward force, we have one, two, three, four, four boxes, you know, essentially whatever these units are, four of these down, and how many up? One, two, three, four, four up, so everything cancels, we're good, that's the best answer. Number 17, a cart with an unknown mass is at rest on one side of the track. A student must find the mass of the cart by using Newton's second law. The student attaches the force probe to the cart and pulls it while keeping the, co uh, the force constant. Kind of like a mu the shoe lab, right? The motion detector rests on the opposite end of the track to record the acceleration of the cart as it's pulled. The student uses the measured force and acceleration values to determine the, cart, the cart's mass to be 0.4 kilograms. When, the, when placed on a balance, however, the cart's mass is found to be 0 0.5 kilograms, which is the following could explain the difference in mass. All right, now you know the answer is A, right? The track was never was not level and was tilted slightly downward. Why would this affect his readings, right? Well, if you're affecting the re if your tilt track is slightly downward, right? And this is more than slight here, but you get the idea. And here's the object. Isn't the gravitational force having components going to kind of help us down the ramp? We have the red component down the ramp, right? And then we're going to have the blue component into the ramp. So as we go to pull this thing, we got to pull it with an apply force down the ramp, right? We're, and this is the force we're measuring, right? But if we also have this red component of weight down the ramp, isn't that red force kind of helping us down to pull the force down the ramp? And so won't our applied force that we're actually pulling with be smaller? We won't need to pull as hard as we would on a flat surface because that red component of gravity is kind of helping us to pull the, to pull the object, right? So we don't need to pull as hard. And if the force we measure with is not as high, then the mass, we, we'll, it'll, we'll, our, our math will work out that the mass is lower because we weren't pulling as hard, right? Remember, um, how are force and mass related to? Let's see, well, acceleration equals, or let me do uh, F equals MA here. F equals MA, so you can see how they're directly related, right? If, assuming A stays constant, if the force goes down, mass goes down. So we're gonna, met, if our, we're not applying as much force because we don't need to, because gravity is kind of helping us pull the block, right? That red component. So if the force goes down, that means mass will also go down. We're going we're gonna to measure the mass to be smaller than it actually is because we're on an incline. All right, I hope that makes sense. Uh, so we're 18 real quick. Number 18, uh, we have a graph, a velocity time graph. Again, right away we're thinking about, okay, what kind of things can the velocity time graph tell us? Slope equals acceleration. Area under the curve equals displacement. And at a 0.5 kilogram object is in free fall as it falls downward near to the surface of a planet, so not necessarily Earth. A graph of the object's velocity as a function of time is shown. What is the force of gravity due? Uh, what is the force due to gravity exerted on the object by the planet? All right, so force of gravity is equal to mg. We know that it gives us the mass of the object. We just got to find out what acceleration is, and we'll have fg. So fg equals mass, which is 0.5. All right, so what is g? Well, that's the acceleration, right? So what's the slope of the uh, graph here, right? Remember, little g is acceleration due to gravity, right? Acceleration due to gravity. And it could be on any planet. Not it doesn't have to be Earth. We use Earth the most common place. We talk about this stuff, but it doesn't have to be on Earth. It could be anywhere. So what is it on this place? So it looks like we go down 5 over 2, down 5 over 2, down 5. So, we're, so our, change, our slope, m, change in y over change in x is equal to down 5, so negative 5, over 2. So negative 5 over 2 is negative 2 and a half. So I'm going to put a negative 2 and a half here. And it looks like we don't really care about the fact that it's uh, negative or whatever. So the force is half of 2 and a half. That's 1.25 newtons. 
So there we go. The answer is B. All right. Okay, let's go to number 19. All right, number 19. We have a um, hanging box here from two different strings at different angles. A box of mass M hangs from a massless string uh, strings as shown in the figure above. The angle between strings 1 and 2 is 90 degrees. Uh, and what does it say? And angles that the string makes with the ceiling is our theta 1 and theta 2 respectively. If T1 in the ten is the tension in string 1, and which is the following are the magnitudes of the horizontal and vertical components of the tension in string 2. All right, well, we have to, guys, this is just, again, one of those things we have to recognize that the, the string, the object, sorry, is hanging there. It's not accelerating. That means that the net forces in the x direction are zero, and the net forces in the y direction must be zero, right? Now, think about this, guys. What if the only, besides the tension, and it has components, right? We have horizontal components this way, vertical this way, same thing for T1, horizontal, vertical. But the only other force in this system is the mass of the box, right? It's hanging. So it has downward mg forces. Now, these are both upward forces from the tension, right? Mass or the weight of the box is down. Well, doesn't that mean that if our net force is zero, that T1 sine theta? Let me make this. Okay, this is an alternate interior angle here, an alternate interior angle here, theta 2. Uh, you call this theta one here, this angle right here, and this theta two. They're giving us this angle here, but these are alternate interior angles, right? Gotta recognize alternate interior angles there. So it's just theta two, same as that angle. This theta one, same as that angle there. Okay. Um, so T one sine theta plus T two sine theta gotta add up to be mg, right? So let's look at our vertical component. It's asking what is the tension in string two? Well, let's let's look at uh, the vertical component, let's see, T2 must be equal to or, so, okay. so the vertical component of, we can, we can replace this T2 sine theta, let's just call it T2y, like the vertical component, right? I'm going to uh, subtract T1 sine theta this side. So I get mg minus t1 sine theta. Okay, so that's the y component. What about the x component? Well, the x component, there, there's only two forces in the horizontal directions, right? And that's going to be the rightward component here and this leftward component here. So that means that, again, that the forces add up to zero, right? So doesn't that mean that the t2 cosine theta, well, let's just call it t2x, right? The horizontal component of t2. Let's call it t2x. Doesn't it have to equal? T1 cosine theta, since they got to be equal, the right, this part to the left and to the right must be equal. I got to be the same, right? So that's why the answer is A. The horizontal component of T2, which we're calling T2x, must be the same as the horizontal component of T1, which is T1 cosine theta. And the vertical component of T2, which we're calling T2y, must be equal to the weight force of the box that's hanging minus the tension force the vertical component of tension force from T1, right? T2 vertical gets like the leftover, right? So it's the weight minus whatever T1 sine theta is using. So that's why the answer is A, because we have both those correct components in there. Okay. All right, number 20. Almost done. A box of mass M is on a rough inclined plane that is at an angle theta with a horizontal, a force of magnitude F, capital F, at an angle of, I think that's rho, if I remember my Greek signs, but I'm gonna call it rho, even if it's not rho, but I think it's, I think, I think it's rho. Right? Or maybe it's phi. Ooh, I think it's phi, now that I think about it. So we have angle theta, here is this theta, this guy, theta, and then rho, or phi, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's phi, is up here, right, it's different, different guy. Um, with the plane, is zero on the block, as shown above. As the block moves up the plane, I'm moving up the plane, there's a frictional force between the box and the plane of magnitude f, little f. What is the magnitude of the net force acting on the block? All right, well, uh, the net force is going to be the, in the parallels of the plane, right? The normal force, which is this way, and remember we have weight force down, right? Mg component down the ramp, into the ramp. Uh, this component here and this component will cancel out, right? Because the normal force and the component of gravity into the ramp will cancel because they're the only perpendicular forces that exist. So we'll get rid of those. I'm not going to bother drawing them, right? 
Um, what are we left with? We're left with a frictional force here, and then we're left with that other component of gravity in, uh, sorry, down the ramp here. Right? So we have two forces down the ramp, and then this component here up the ramp, right? So our net force in this direction, our uh, parallel to the plane, is going to be this. Let's do this force first. That's our positive up the ramp. So it's F cosine phi. I think I'm pretty sure it's phi. Um, that's this guy, right? Cosine of this angle, adjacent to that angle, parallel, which is parallel to the ramp, right? Minus this. This is messy over here. Redraw re re this. Minus the component down the ramp, right, of gravity, down the ramp here of gravity, right? So that's going to be mg sine theta, right? Because that's, again, this is our angle theta here. If we make well, that's theta there, whereas this is phi up here. And then also minus the friction force, which they're just calling f. So luckily for us, kind of nice, we don't have to like derive it and use mu, mg, blah, 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 that stuff. They just say, hey, friction force is just called f. So this is it. This is our answer. Answer is, looks like, uh, C. Yeah. Answer is C. Uh, F cosine phi minus mg sine theta minus F. Those are all the forces parallel to the ramp. Um, the only reason why this one's a little tricky is because they have two different angles. But again, if we're clear, if we understand well this idea of, you know, components and parallel to the ramp and all that stuff, then we should be okay. That's number 20. Go to 21. The objects... Uh, oh, three objects can move. Uh, oh, start over. Three objects, <laughs> three objects can only move along a straight level path. Okay, so no turning and no going up a hill or anything like that. The graphs below or above, I should should have put, show the position d of each object plotted as a function of time t. All right, so these are distance time graphs. So right away we see distance time graphs or displacement time graphs. You should say position time graphs. We think, okay, what does the slope tell us? Slope is velocity. The area of the curve tells us nothing because it's area of the curve of a displacement time graph doesn't mean anything. But slope is velocity, so we know that. All right, so the question is, the sum of the forces on the object is zero in which of the cases? So in other words, the net force, sum, net force, same thing, right? Is zero in which of the cases? Well, if we have a net force of zero, therefore acceleration is also zero. So in which, in which case do we have zero acceleration? Well, we in, it's going to be in two and in one, right? So the answer is C, because what's happening in graph one? It's we are we do have a velocity, we have a slope, but is it changing? No. So velocity is constant. If velocity is constant, that means that we're not accelerating, our velocity isn't changing. In graph two, the graph is a flat horizontal line. That means that we're actually at rest. We're not moving at all, right? We have zero velocity, and our again our velocity isn't changing, so therefore we are not accelerating. In graph three, however, the slope starts off flat and gets steeper, which means the velocity starts off low and gets larger, which means velocity is changing, so we are accelerating, so it can't be graph three, just graphs one and two. All right, last two coming up. We made it. All right, this is the multi-answer questions. Gotta pick two. All right, so we have a system of uh, cords and boxes here hanging from the ceiling. The system shown above consists of two identical blocks that are suspended using four cords each of a different length, which is the following claims are true about the magnitudes of the tensions in the cords, select two answers. All right. Um, okay, so uh, the answers are B and C, so let's talk about why. All right, so why is it not, why is it not A? All right, so uh, the tension, wh why is the tension in one, uh, cord one, not as much as tension two? Well, uh, you'll, if you kind of look, look at the components here, we have the component here, and the component here, uh, I, if you if you have time on problems like this, I would recommend like making up numbers sometimes. It might help you like make up a mass of m and the other mass of m. Maybe make them just both like one kilogram, something really easy to work with, and mess with that. This is gonna be 30 degrees here. This is gonna be 60 degrees here. Right. Also, those are alternate interior angles. All right. So why is T1 not greater than T2? Well, if we look at the vertical components here, right, we know that this component here. And this component here must add up to the total mass of the system, right? This is the only other vertical forces applied to the system. Um, so that means that uh, this component here, this cord, right, is going to be supporting the majority of the weight. How do you know that? Well, because it's more vertical, right? 
do sine this component here is sine 60 it's going to be whatever t2 is times sine 60 this component here is going to be sine 30 so be t1 sine 30 uh, sine of 30 is a half sine of 60 I think it's like 0.6 or 0.8 or something like that, sine of 16. Yeah, 0 0.87, 0 0.87. So you see how this number is, is a larger number? So whatever whatever the tension hit here, uh, this, this vertical component is gonna be more here than it is for this guy, right? So we know that the vertical component, at least for T2, is larger than the vertical component for T1. And maybe you're thinking right now, oh, but mister, it doesn't say the vertical component for A, it just says that T1. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But let's think about the horizontal components. Don't they have to be equal? I know that my drawing, they're not very equal, not to scale, but don't they have to be? They're the only horizontal forces, right? So the, the rightward force here and the leftward force here in the tension, they must cancel each other out. They must be equal because they're the only horizontal forces that exist in the system. And we know the net force is zero because it's just hanging there, right? So if these two horizontal forces are equal, and we know that the vertical component for two is larger than the vertical component for one, then it kind of stands to reason that T2 is actually larger than T1, which is the opposite of what they're saying in A. So it cannot be A. B is correct. We just kind of talked about it, right? We talked about how the horizontal components of T2 here, I'm getting, it's getting real messy again. <laughs> Let me erase some of these lines so you can see better, sorry. We just talked about how uh, the vertical component of T, sorry, the horizontal component of T2 here must be equal to the horizontal component of T1 there. And again, I know that not to scale the drawing here, but they have to be equal, right? Because they're the only horizontal components that exist, and so they have to cancel. And so isn't T1 cosine 30? That's this guy. And isn't T2 cosine 60? That's this guy. Got to equal, right? So B is true. Um, C is also true because T3 is larger than T4, simply because look at the weight that T3 has to, uh, that this cord, what we're calling cord 3, or the tension in cord 3, has to support, has to support more weight, right? This cord is supporting this mass and this mass. It's got to pull up both. But cord four, the tension here, is only supporting one mass. It's only supporting that guy, right? So it doesn't have to be as much. So it stands to reason that T3 is larger than D4 because it's supporting more weight, right? It's, at the, it's up here, supporting both boxes. Um, D is not correct because T1 plus T2 does not equal T3. Um, if it had said the vertical components of T1 and T2 added up will be T3, I would agree with that statement, but that's not what it says. It's talking about the total force tension in the, in, in the total cores, and those will not add up to be T3 because uh, the T1 and T2 are both also having to do this horizontal force, which the T3 does not have to worry about. So T1 and T2 will, if you add them up, will be much, much larger than T3 because of these horizontal components, all right? Okay, that's 22, this is the last one, number 23, last question. This is, I think, pretty straightforward. Most, most students will be able to figure this one out. So we have these four blocks. Given the net forces on and the masses of the block shown above, which two blocks have the same acceleration? Select two answers. So what we're looking for here is kind of like proportion. We want to find the blocks that have the same proportion of mass to force, right? So the answer is going to, of course, A and D, as you already know. And the reason why is look at the mass here. Mass is 5 and force is 20. All right, so what would the acceleration be? Acceleration is, is force over mass. So for block A, uh, the force is 20, and the mass is 5. So 20 over 5 is 4. For the block D, it's the same proportions, right? If we, we multiply everything by 4, the force on block D is 80. That's 4 times more than 20. And the mass of block D is 20, but that's also four times more than the mass of block A. So kind of the same proportions, right? So we, again, if we solve it, A equals the force, which is 80, over the mass, which is 20. 80 over 20 is also four. So four meters per second squared acceleration for block D, and four meters per second squared of acceleration for block A. So they're gonna be the same. If you do block B and C, they will not be the same as any of the other ones. So A and D is the correct answer. So there you go. They were done with our corrections. Thank goodness that was a that was a while, but hopefully you go to skip around and, and solve the problems. So, all right, guys. Hope that was hope that was helpful to you. On, 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 with all sincerity, I really am trying to help you guys understand the material better. So if these corrections, this style of corrections that we're doing, we're trying here, is not helpful, 
let me know. Tell me what tell me what would be helpful for you to not only bump up your grade, but help you understand the material. I know you guys care about your grade a lot, but I care more about you understanding the material than your grade so much. So um, if you have a different idea to how to do corrections to help yourself uh, improve, let me know what that idea is and I'll consider it. All right, guys, hope you learned something. Hope it helped. Have a great night. Go Astros. I have no life. You are my life. See you next time. Bye-bye.